This is part one of the rapid review series to increase your points on test day for the U.S. Assembly Step 2 CK and for the U.S. Assembly Step 3. So let's begin. Giardia is a flagellated pear-shaped trophozoite with two large central nuclei. So symptoms you would see is diarrhea that is foul smelling and fatty, as well as abdominal pain, bloating, cramping, and weight loss due to overgrowth of this parasite. And also commonly seen on the Yosemite is that the patient or the scenario would mention that they went camping. So you would treat these patients with metronidazole, which is an extremely high yield drug to know. So if a patient is being treated for a Giardia infection and they drink alcohol, they can develop what is called a disulfiram-like reaction, which occurs due to a buildup of acetaldehyde. So let's give another scenario. Let's say that a patient has a bloody diarrhea and liver abscess. More than likely, this patient has entamoeba histolytica, and this is also treated with metronidazole. So if a patient is being treated for a giardia, entamoeba, or any other of the indications for metronidazole, and they drink alcohol with it, they can develop a disulfiram-like reaction, extremely high yield. So, a patient is being treated for a giardia, and then they develop vomiting and altered mental status. You would suspect a disulfiram-like reaction. So, biostatus is extremely high yield for the U.S. only step 3. So, it's important to know these basic concepts. So, generalizability answers a question. How generalizable are the results of a study to other populations? So this basically looks at the fact that the results can be used beyond the cohort that was studied. However, internal validity looks at the specific cohorts itself and it answers, are the results obtained in this specific cohort valid? Okay, let's take a closer look at preterm labor. So preterm labor is defined as regular contractions causing cervical changes at less than 37 weeks gestation with intact membranes. So the management of preterm labor is very high yield. One important thing that you must know is that you always give steroids such as dexamethasone when treating these patients. And... Uh, Dexamethasone is given to decrease the risk of conditions such as intraventricular hemorrhage and also to decrease the risk of overall neonatal mortality. So you should always give penicillin if the group B strep status of the mother is positive or unknown. However, there are some specific drugs that you need to give based on the weeks of gestation. So give magnesium sulfate if less than 32 weeks gestation. Another important fact is tocolysis. So if less than 32 weeks, give indomethacin. If between 32 to 34 weeks, give nifedipine. If between 34 to 37 weeks, then tocolysis is not indicated. This is extremely high yield. You can pause the video here and take a look at this a bit closer and memorize it so that you do not miss these points on exam day. So since we just mentioned magnesium sulfate, let's take a closer look at this drug. So it's typically given at less than 32 weeks and this is to provide fetal neuroprotection. So it's found to re reduce the risk of cerebral palsy. Also, magnesium sulfate is given for seizure prophylaxis or treatment in preeclampsia or eclampsia. Again, extremely high yield. If you are enjoying this content so far and you want to see more videos like this, please be sure to pop that like button, hit subscribe, and that notification bell so that you never miss another high yield video like this. So let's continue for a rapid review for the Yosemite Step 2 CK and Step 3. So another high yield thing is pharmacology, and they love the cancer drugs. So let's just review this. Vincristine inhibits microtubule formation. 
it's very important that you know the adverse effects of these cancer drugs. So for vincristine, it is peripheral neuropathy. Cyclophosphamide, it can cause adverse effects such as hemorrhagic cystitis. However, you can prevent hemorrhagic cystitis with mesna. Another high yield drug is cisplatin. So the adverse effects of cisplatin include nephrotoxicity, ototoxicity. You can prevent the nephrotoxicity by using amifostine. Okay, so let's say that a patient comes into your office or calls you and says, hey, um, my boss, you know, didn't believe that I was in the hospital and they want to call you to verify or something of the sort. Um, is this, you know, this verbal authorization to um, divulge the patient's information sufficient? And yes, it is. So as stated here, a verbal authorization from a patient to a physician is sufficient for a physician to respond to an employer's request for health information. But it's important to note that let's say that patient came in and they had um, like an abscess and severe fever due to like uh, complications from an STI. Are you going to tell the employer every single detail like that? No. So what's very important to note is that there is a principle of minimum necessary disclosure. So if the employer is just calling and saying, hey, um, is or was this patient in the hospital during this and this time? That's it. Like you can just say yes. You don't have to say yes. They had, um, they came in with fever, nausea, and vomiting, you know, chills. And it turns out that, that no. <laughs> so minimum necessary disclosure. Um, that's important to note. So let's continue. Okay, another extremely high yield principle is toxicology. If a patient presents with acute PCP intoxication, then they'll have symptoms of psychosis, bizarre behavior, they're agitated, they're extremely aggressive, um, they probably have like superhuman strength. And what's extremely high yield to note is the nystagmus that presents with this. Extremely, extremely high yield. And they can also have a taxia. So if the patient comes in and they're agitated, they're aggressive, you can go ahead and chemically sedate them with benzodiazepines such as intramuscular lorazepam or midazolam. And this can be used to control those symptoms. So... If they come in with BCD overdose, then the treatment you can provide is IV fumazenil. And this is a competitive inhibitor of the GABA receptor at the benzodiazepine binding site. So if a patient comes in with BCD overdose, they can present with sedation and potential respiratory depression. So another high yield fact that I want to bring up is Let's say that a person chronically um, uses BZDs. Um, however, they present with uh, fever and an increased respiratory rate. In that setting, you want to suspect that this patient has an infection, right? Um, it, it sounds pretty obvious, but the assembly of the examiners can present stuff in a very convoluted way um, that can really trip you up on this point. So if they are on a medication that typically causes respiratory depression, but their, um, their respiratory rate is increased, say they don't have any fever, but their respiratory rate is increased, that should clue you into that there might be something more going on here, and it could possibly be due to an infection. Another high yield fact is still murmurs. So a still murmur is a benign, asymptomatic murmur of childhood that presents with a grade 1 to 2 systolic murmur, and it's best heard at the lower left sternal border. Another high yield condition to know is acute respiratory distress syndrome, and this is characterized by an increase in pulmonary vascular permeability and diffuse pulmonary edema with a proteinaceous exudate. 
It's associated with conditions such as sepsis, trauma, pneumonia, aspiration, and shock. Okay, now let's take a closer look at this high yield condition. So let's say that a patient is a neonate and they are jaundiced. And when you do the labs, you realize that they have elevated conjugated bilirubin. Well, this is suggestive of biliary atresia. So biliary atresia is caused by an abnormal underdevelopment of the extrahepatic biliary system. So what happens is the neonates are able to conjugate bilirubin normally in the liver, but they're unable to excrete the bile into the GI lumen. So you might be wondering, okay, how else can these patients present? Well, they can present with, of course, jaundice, pale stool, dark urine, poor weight gain, and if it's left untreated, they can go on to develop more serious conditions such as cirrhosis, coagulopathy, and portal hypertension. Another high yield fact to remember is that conjugated bilirubin, which is elevated in biliary atresia, is water soluble. So this is semi good news because that means that they cannot go on to develop carnicterus. Remember that carnicterus occurs due to an accumulation of unconjugated bilirubin in the brain. So to treat these patients with biliary atresia, we can use surgical porta enterostomy to allow bile to be excreted or a liver transplant. If you want to continue learning more how you point for the Yosemite Step 2CK and the Yosemite Step 3, then all you have to do is click this video right here.